This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Oh, locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast. This is America's Car Radio Show. If you have a throttle and you like a throttle, we'll feature throttles all day on air, online, on mobile, or on smart speaker. This is our auto expert. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with truck girl Jen, who was suspiciously absent from the Texas truck uh, Mm -hmm. or from the Texas State Fair this week. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't go. Uh-huh. You wasn't invited, was you? No, I wasn't invited. <laughs> um, they had trucks and 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 trucks. Yeah, and I'm jealous and jealous and jealous and jealous. There was a lot of new trucks <laughs> unveiled, the new Nissan Titan, the new Chevy uh, this, the new Ram that, the new Ford. Ford actually dropped a bombshell there because, you know, Chevy have had that 35,500 uh, pounds of towing. Yeah, that's what I heard. And they have a big anvil on the back of a truck, and they tow it out, and it's like, hey, look at us. We have the best towing. And then Ford came out with a big truck that has letters on the back that says 37,000 pounds. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> it was really interesting to see them do that. There's everybody's Chevy, the Chevy's booth in the mouth. It's like, it like. Yeah, I bet. That was the jaw hitting the ground. Yeah. Yeah, that was what happened. <laughs> See that? You want to hear someone at Chevy's jaw hit the ground? That was like that. Uh, it was fun. Texas State Fair. They didn't have the fair's not open for the first two days for the public on uh, Thursday. It's open just to the automotive media because they, they call it the Texas uh, Auto Show. And so there was no fried food. I missed out. There was a lot of cowboy stuff. Yeah. A lot of cowboy stuff, and uh, but no fried food. A lot of beef. Um, there was nothing green at any single meal I went to. In fact, uh, I have an English guy there that we work with. Uh, one of the companies is called Share Rocket. They took me out of dinner on Thursday night. Nothing green in the restaurant. That doesn't surprise me. It's nothing Texas. green. I think the the greenest thing in the restaurant was corn, and that was not green, clearly. It was yellow. So nothing green at all in the restaurant. Uh, the, the closest vegetable I saw in Texas was corn. I guess if you get you know, the avocados. They do a lot of avocado toast for breakfast and that sort of thing. But it was fun. It was good. So next year I get to go, right? I don't know. <laughs> we, we may not be invited back next year. <laughs> uh, the, we did see a new Nissan truck unveiled. The new Titan. Yeah, it's a mid-cycle jealous. refresh. Uh, it, it's nice. They've done a lot with the front. And for the first time inside the Nissan badge... Mm-hmm. So everyone knows what the Nissan badge looks like. Well, they have it's now lava orange, the letters in the Nissan letters inside the badge. And that's the first time they've ever done that. Lava orange in the badge. And then the new truck has a new front up, you know, in front it looks uh, a lot more rough and tumble, a lot more black, a lot more plastic. Uh I I prefer the blacked out trucks. This is a big fashion, isn't it? Right yeah, now. my truck's blacked out. I blacked out the wheels on my Lexus GX, and um, my other half wasn't too thrilled. They're more of a chromey, sparkly type of person. I'm more of a blacked out. Watch out. Here I come. Okay, do you like matte black or glossy? No, matte black. Matte okay. black. Well, and you know what? The other black I like is the uh, the bronzed black. Yes. And they do the bronze black look. That's mm-hmm. kind of cool, too. But I always feel like I'm in the CIA when I drive one of those trucks that's all blacked out. Like, hey, look, undercover, special ops. Don't mess with me. I could have, like, a bazooka in here. You wish. Uh, <laughs> well, perhaps I do. Who knows? The, uh, yeah, so I like the more blacked out trucks. It was interesting. Like, Texas is a total experience. You know, you don't, it's not all pig races and cattle. It's, uh, there's a lot of trucks there on display. 2.4 million people will go through that fair in the next 24 days. That's fantastic. That's a lot of fried Oreos. Fried Oreos? That's a big thing down there. Deep serious? fried Oreos. Wow. I'm too scared to try them. Anything deep fried I stay away from usually. Deep fried, so here, deep fried Kool-Aid. N- no. Yeah, deep fried Oreos. <laughs> no. Deep fried Pepsi. What? 
the big thing this year was deep fried uh, duck a l'orange. I don't know. It doesn't sound good, does it? No. Oh, everybody's shaking their head in the studio. <laughs> Sounds Poor ducks. A bit. Megan will be here in the next segment, cause, and we can say this now because she can't respond, but people from Texas are a little bit different. Little bit. Little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. it's in, That was interesting, but there's a lot of fun new vehicles. I, I got to meet uh, Mike uh, Koval Jr., who's the new uh, VP at uh, Ram Trucks as well. And this is a guy from Detroit who showed up a 96 degree temperature to introduce four of their new trucks wearing a, th- a suit. Good for him. We they were handing him napkins all the way through his speech. It oh. looked like there was a faucet on the top of his head, which was running. Poor guy. I feel really. He's from Detroit. He, I don't think he really knew what he was in for. So Dave, Dave Elsoff, who is the uh, the PR manager there. I like Dave. Dave was handing him like handkerchiefs through the speech, <laughs> and he's mopping his forehead. And it was just, and oh. and, and poor old Mike doesn't. He's not a. Uh, he doesn't have a big full head of hair. Yeah. He has a bit of the Scott Brown hair, uh, where you know you can tell it the used Scott to be great, Brown but they hair. shave it close to the head. And uh, all he kept doing was patting his head in the Texas heat as he introduced their new uh, blacked out trucks. I felt bad because you know it was just you know he just kept going. He's a new guy. He's 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 been in the business a long years, but he's he's at the you know it was his he's at the top now. He's the big cheese. He's the he's the in charge of things. So he does the speeches. And he kept reading from that teleprompter all about their new black tout trucks as that water flowed down the side of his face and was dripping off his chin the whole speech. I did feel for him. And I'll tell you something else, too. 96 degrees in September, the end of September. How We're just it? about to go into October. How is the humidity? Uh, it's not too bad. But Texas, uh, Dallas area is really flat. Yeah. So there's no wind from the hills, or there's no water, so there's no wind off the... So the air doesn't move. Have you ever tried to walk through clam chowder? <laughs> yeah, Nick, every day. Okay, because no. that's what it's like. <laughs> that's what it's like in Texas. It's like walking through clam chowder. So they, you know, one thing that they want in their truck is air conditioning. Oh, yeah. You can put aftermarket, like the Meat Locker 5000, in the back of that truck just to keep it cool. You need it. I'm telling you, there's nothing like uh, getting out of a truck and everywhere it was touching the seat is absolutely soaking wet. It's not pretty. Yeah. It's not pretty Great at all. Great visual. This is where interior, black interiors don't work so well inside vehicles. <laughs> That's why and, they have the cooling seats now. Well, you, you think automatic start is there just to heat the vehicle up? And it, no, it's to cool it's it to down. cool it down. All right. We've got more stuff on the show. An absolute packed two hours in our auto accident. Stand by. More stuff to come. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Welcome back to the show. Uh, so the Frankfurt Auto Show recently uh, happened. And uh, it was pretty dominated by one vehicle, which is the new Land Rover Defender. But Perry Stern was there to take a look at the new vehicles that were on display. Um, and Perry, so was there anything else there apart from the Land Rover Defender you happened to notice? Or was it all Defender, Defender, Defender? No, no, no. There was much more than Defender. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and it was mostly uh, electrified. There's a whole bunch of electricity going on there. All right. Well, so so talk to us about the things that were most impressive for you, because I know there was the you know v, the VW group had quite a bit of electrified stuff. They did, and everything was looking pretty impressive, and it ranged quite the gamut. So at one end, you had the pretty much out, pretty outrageous the Lamborghini Sion, I believe it's how it's pronounced. Uh, this is a one-off extreme exotic car but it's a hybrid it's the first hybrid from lamborghini right uh the the v12 combines with an electric motor you get 819 horsepower wow just that's zero just about enough under yeah just about you know zero to 60 is under three seconds top speed 217 miles an hour and uh you know it's one of those if you have to ask how much it doesn't matter because they're all sold anyway. Right. Well, the, this Lamborghini have a reputation for this. When I was at Pebble Beach, it was like they unveiled two different cars, and then I said, "Oh, that's really great." Uh, when did they go on sale? They, oh no, we we only made sixty three, and they're all sold. So goodbye. That's an interesting color yeah. that they chose too to launch it in. Yeah. It looked really cool. Did it? Uh, 
and it photographed really well, which is what I, you know, what I look for in a car. Yeah, I like the uh, rims. But, yeah, the rims, the gold rims, the gold with that green paint looked mm -hmm. really good. The green paint but looks like, across, uh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, it looks like something to do with a baby, but I'm yeah. not going to get there. It's all <laughs> green. It looks better than that in person. <laughs> That's gross. <laughs> it's not their eye color either, I'll just tell you. Uh, it, yeah, in, interesting choice of color. Uh, so, so wait a second. How, how many are they building, and how many did they sell? Um, they sold them all, right. and I believe they're only building uh, sixty-three of them. I believe right. is the number. Um, and actually, they have the number on the side of the car as well. But, uh, but like you said, they're they're already sold, um, and for the most part, it's Lamborghini owners that are buying this car. Let me just do uh, some math. What we so, see with me... Ferrari, it's what we see with. Bugatti, Bentley, all of them. Right. Not so much Bentley, but you know, the really small car manufacturers, they build these special one-offs, and then they contact all the people that own them, and they sell them to the people that own them. So wait, so business model. let me do some math here. So how much were they? Like um, I believe that the price in the Lamborghini was... Around three million. All right, oh so my. that's uh, to one hundred and eighty, one hundred eighty nine thousand dollars, a million dollars they made just in one show. Hey, that's way cheaper than the what is it, the Bugatti that they just released? No, that was three million. Oh, that was, it was 8 ten million. Eight point eight. Uh, oh, that was eight point eight million euros. So that's ten million U.S. dollars, I think. See like again, oh, one, one of the things. Actually, with the Bugatti that the Bugatti that they showed at Pebble, I think, was eleven or twelve million, something right. like that. Yeah. And they only made know, ten it's, though. It's all silly money anyway and but. you know something bugatti and uh, lamborghini are the same company so there you go they're raking the cash in the maybe chain. they could pay for lunch one exactly. time <laughs> all right what else do you see well across the way from the lamborghini still in the volkswagen group was the all-new porsche Taycan, yeah, which this... is their fully electric porsche they did a uh, reveal of this and... simultaneously in canada didn't they when they did it I believe so, yes. Yeah. So this was my first time seeing it in person, and it looks, you know, if you look at it from the silhouette, it looks a lot like a four-door 911, but done well, as opposed to Panamera, which was a little bulbous, in my opinion. I should also um, point out, Perry, that uh, Porsche is the same company as uh, Bugatti, is the same company as Lamborghini. Again. So again, they're change. raking exactly. it in. <laughs> All right, tell us. And, and, you know, to continue that trend, Volkswagen also showed the ID3, which is at the other end of the scale. <laughs> right. This, you know, they've been showing us these electric cars for years, it seems. This is finally the first production version of one of these, the Volkswagen ID models, not coming to America, uh, but uh, this will be going on sale, I believe, next year as a fully electric vehicle coming from Volkswagen. So I noticed they have an ID3 and an ID4, and that clearly they have a big naming department. Yes, and that might change as we uh, go forward with their new uh, uh, chair, chief operating officer. Right, which is? But uh, uh, I believe it's Johan Denison, yes. uh, who has had a habit of naming cars in other car companies by uh, initials and letters that don't really make a lot of sense. So, right, so he, uh, was, he was responsible. ID five coming to a dealership near you. Right. Soon. He was responsible for naming all the, inf changing all the names in the Infinity lineup. From uh, whatever they use, and the Cadillacs to be. as well. And Cadillac, yeah. So let's see if he can screw uh, so up VW too. Wait, you're telling me they used to have better exactly. names, exactly, and yeah. now they're just numbers. Yeah, they used to have Cadillacs used to have names, and now they're numbers. Did you yeah, get a chance yeah. to see the Cupra? Is that how you say it? Which one? Cupra, C U P R A. Oh, the the Seat, I believe it was, wasn't it? Um. I did see it. We didn't include it in much in our coverage because, frankly, we don't get to have it here. Uh, but it was a great-looking little crossover. Uh, I think it, you know, it would do well here if Seat were selling here. But again, we're still in the Volkswagen Group. Yeah, Seat um, is sort jumping, of the, the, the jumping the, out from the Volkswagen Group a little bit. The, they're they're um, the rung Seat are the rung below VW, right? They're sort of the cheap the cheap VWs. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, um, right. and only sold in Europe. But they're not sold yeah, here, right? But, Sorry, uh, and you know it is worth pointing out. Most of the news came from German automakers. There was, you know, it was a quieter show, just like all the other auto shows we've been seeing. Uh, that a lot of, you know, there were no U.S. car companies there. 
Right. And uh, there weren't much in the way of Japanese. I mean, Honda showed the E concept, or right. not a concept, it's production cars. So it's their new production model, again, not coming to America. Right. Uh, which is too bad because it's kind of cute. I like it. Uh, it, it and looks- Hyundai even showed an electric race car. I know. I like the Hyundai. Uh, uh, what was it called? The uh, well, the concept was called the 45 EV concept. Yeah, I like it. Uh, I've seen pictures of it. It does. It looks really good. Um, it's very wide and low. It's got a nice silhouette. Uh, you know, very much a concept car. It's got swivel seats inside, and I'm sure it'll drive itself like everything else that's in the future. <laughs> right. Well, um, BMW uh, and, and Mercedes in, introduced concepts as well. They did. Uh, and BMW showed the what will be the next uh, 4 Series. Awesome. And the first thing most people will notice when they look at it is that grill. Yeah. You, uh, you thought the grill couldn't uh, get any bigger, it got bigger. It got bigger on a smaller car, which is, you know, I'm hoping they don't go the Lexus route where, you know, it's all grill and then they put a car behind it. I yeah. hear um, that the next grills are going to be from the windshield down to the tires. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <love> the Lexus <laughs> You'll Why? actually be looking through the grill as you drive the car. It would be That's cheaper great. just to have no hood and have a big grill. Seriously, because you make it a plastic. Exactly. All right. So it's, like Which is too bad for the, the BMW, because it's the concept for the silhouette looks like an 8 Series. It, the car looks absolutely gorgeous. And the grill has grown on me the more I look at it, but it still like it. looks a little toothy to me. Now, let me ask you in the last minute we have, what was the idea with this uh, Audi uh, Trail Quattro? It looks more like a dune buggy. It does. And uh, this is actually the fourth in a series of AI cars that they built. Uh, this is the last of them, but the others were designed for luxury, for the city, uh, and for commuting. This one is designed for going off-road, uh, clearly, when taking a look at it. And it is designed to drive autonomously or with uh, you know somebody driving it for you. And the, one of the coolest features of this is it does not have headlights. It has drones with lights on them. They can actually fly ahead and light up the road for you as you continue down right, the trail. That, that, that'll make it a production, I'm sure. Okay, were the tires oh, actually absolutely, rubber? Absolutely, absolutely. Were the tires rubber? Uh, yes, those are rubber tires. They look, uh, yes, they are rubber tires. Uh, don't like any of it. I mean, it's, inter- <laughs> it's interesting. Perry, where can we read your stuff? Uh, you can see it on MSN. You can see it on our Auto Expert or on AutoNXT.net. All right, you're fabulous, and I'm, I vicariously live through you. So thank you for that. <laughs> let, let me go and see Certainly. all this stuff. Always, always happy to help. Perry Stern <laughs> uh, with his report on the Frankfurt Auto Show. Thank you, Perry. And of course, you can read everything at ourautoexpert.com. Coming up, we're going to talk a little bit about the cars in the parking lot down here outside the radio station and the fact that we got people turning up taking pictures of them. We're also going to talk about the brand new uh, Ford Explorer ST on our Auto Expert. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert podcast. So Megan's joined us for uh, for the show. Hello. Uh, you missed the whole thing about Texas. I know. I'm very upset about that. No, it's good because we, we dogged on Texas a little bit for having nothing green to eat. That's ridiculous and untrue. Uh, no, it's not. I was there. You I were saw at it with the my own fair. Eyes. He lies. was at the Texas State Fair. All that doesn't lies. count. Deep fried lies. Are you sure they oh. didn't have corn? Like elote? Yeah, corn's not a vegetable. Whatever. Ketchup is not a vegetable either. Just, <laughs> let you know. Just in case you thought it was. Uh, we drove some pretty cool cars. All three of us drove cool cars today. Uh, Megan drove the new uh, Chevy Blazer RS. Uh, Jen drove the new GTR Track Edition. And I drove the new Toyota Supra. And they're all parked outside the studio. And I can see the parking lot from sitting. I'm looking. I'm sitting in the studio here. And I'm right by the window. And I can outlook to all of the cars in the parking lot. And people have been showing up. And then they know that we have cool cars when we come to the show. They're showing up and taking pictures. There's a guy in a Toyota Tacoma truck has been driving around <laughs> the parking lot with a camera out there, with a phone out the window, taking uh, video of all these cool cars. It's like, um, interesting. I find it strange when people do that. I get taking pictures and posting them on Instagram, but when people take video of cars they see in parking lots, I mean, there's usually much better vehicles you can see online. We have the same issue with Run to the Sun. When we did that, people showing up just to do uh, no, pictures of it? Taking pictures, yeah. No, yeah. I don't blame them. I mean, look at the cars we drove. Yeah, we drove some pretty cool cars. I mean, those are really good-looking cars down there. They are. I actually like the Blazer. The only thing I would complain about is it's too expensive. It's like 50 grand, right? 
I like it? mine the best. You could have, I know, of course you do, Jen. We haven't quite got there yet, but clearly we're already there. Um, the Supra and the Blazer are about the same price. They are? Yeah. Yeah, but that's a compl two completely different vehicles. Yeah, two-door bundle of joy, uh, four-door SUV that's too expensive. I know. I, get <laughs> I mean, it's fully loaded. It's got... I get it. When you Look, name it, I, it's in there. If it was $15,000 less, I'd be in. The only thing I don't really like is that uh, automatic braking. I'm like, what is happening? Because oh, you... <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. It's only happened a few The emergency times. braking's <laughs> kicking in. Megan, that only kicks in when it decides that your life is in danger. You're following people too close. <laughs> well, they need to get out of my way. Uh, apparently, <laughs> it's there to protect you and to save the I lives know. of your children. And yeah. clearly, it only jumps in when it decides that you have made poor decisions. You know, it has that rear seat reminder when yeah. you stop the car. Yeah. The back seat. You left that. the kids in the back of the car? No, the kids haven't even gotten in there yet. I've only had okay. it like a day, so. All right. Um, I, I'd own one if I could, you know. I, the thing with Chevy is they price their vehicles so they can give you a lot of discount off. Mm. Uh, the GTR, how many horsepower does it have? 600. Yeah. 600. This is the deal. It's like $100,000. With Yeah, but it had 481 pounds of torque. <laughs> it's like, it's an all-wheel drive sports car. It's like four, it's about $100,000. And yet the, two, the Supra out there. Which has 350 horsepower, something like that. Let me just check. It, the Supra has 335 horsepower. Can you seat four people in the Nissan? Uh, no. You can so, try. Uh, <laughs> it has one of those insurance back seats. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, My so, coffee cup. So the up Supra there. is is uh, is forty nine thousand. So I could get two Supras for the price of one Nissan GTO. Oh my! Uh, no, mine was one forty five. Yeah. All right. Now you lost me. Hundred forty five thousand. It's a great car. I'm not sure I want to pay hundred forty five thousand for it though. God, is it awesome though? It is awesome. That's a lot of money. It is. Like um, you could buy a house in Texas for that. Yes, yes, you could. <laughs> yeah, but twenty four <laughs> valve twin turbo, just amazing. Look at Jen for an extra hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> it's like a it's Christmas. For you. Sorry, I actually could get. Like by the Christmas way, I could get three of the Toyota Supras for the price That's of that fine. One car. I. That's fine. It's I think you can drive that one. I'm just saying, I think that Toyota Supra is one of the best cars they've ever created. Mm. And everyone says, oh, it's a BMW Z4, because they use the Z4 as the, as the platform for it. Mm -hmm. And it's like the Z4 on the inside. A lot of things are like Z4. No. Toyota took a platform and tailored it. I've driven both of them. I love the Z4. Don't get me wrong. It's an amazing sports car, but it's much more of a grand tour, much more of a gentleman's car. It's much softer. It's, it moves when you go around corners. This thing holds the road like you have a firework strapped to your back. It's hmm. amazing. It's, well, now I have to try that. Well, you'll yeah. have to follow Nick. Well, we can I just was like, go, his, Nick, go. <laughs> his, here's the deal. We could just strap a firework to your back. Is that like I would Wiley also be fine with that, right. oddly enough. Wiley Coyote. I want to tell you what's coming up on the show. James Bell is going to be joining us to talk about the Kia Stinger GTS. This is the latest version, uh, trim level of the Kia Stinger. By the way, one of the most uh, brilliant cars I've driven this year. And it comes in a bright orange. Mm -hmm. I think it's called Federation Orange. Uh, and Brian Armstead is going to be joining us to talk about uh, brand new, uh, the Trek Trail, which he, tour he did. He went off-roading. Yeah. Brian seems to be much more of a towel dressing gown four star service guy. I'm not sure he how he's going to do that. And of course, Anton Warman's going to join us as well. That's all coming up in the show. I didn't that was some sort of insult. Next, no, we're, no, no. next <laughs> we're going to talk to Craig Patterson about the Ford Explorer ST. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Now, recently we had the Run to the Sun event, which was in the Northwest Automotive Press Association. Got to drive a bunch of vehicles around the country and have uh, fun in them. Um, and one of the vehicles that was sent by Ford for us to test drive was the Ford Explorer ST, which is the second ST vehicle they've done with Ford's SUV line. And to join us on the phone to talk about it is uh, Craig Patterson, my friend Craig. We seem to run into each other quite a lot, Craig. Hi, Nick. Good, uh, good to talk again. Yeah, we uh, we're meeting all the time. We got so many launches. You're uh, you're always there, and we've always got lots of new products. I really love the uh, Ford Explorer ST. Uh, this is you're sort of fine tuning your ST versions of the SUVs, but this vehicle now puts down 400 horsepower, and it's uh, it's quite a goer, as they would say on the Monty Python show. 
Yeah, it is um, a legitimate ST. It's uh, being able to start from an all-new rear-wheel drive architecture and get in early with our Ford Performance team, get it tuned properly. Um, and then, yeah, you add the 400 horsepower and 415 foot-pounds of torque, and, uh, yeah, it goes. So one of the things that that I look at when I do this is what what you, you have you have the Ford Explorer. This is America's best selling SUV. Police departments around the world use it. It's well known for being a workhorse. It's well known for being a good family vehicle. Then you have to come up with an ST version of it, uh, or not have to. You you'd like to come up with an ST version of it, which is the sort of uh, stepping stone into the Ford Performance uh, whole mantra of vehicles. What makes this vehicle an ST? What do you have to do to make the Ford Explorer an ST and to give it that performance, uh, I guess, shroud? Yeah, so in the past, we've had an Explorer Sport, which was um, on our old uh, uh, front-wheel drive architecture. Um, and it was a good vehicle. It, it was fast, but it didn't handle um, like an ST should. So with the new architecture going to rear-wheel drive, um, and um, being able to um, get in again with Ford Performance, have them tune the steering properly. You want to make sure you've got the brakes. You've got to make sure that it handles. You've got to make sure that um, in the turns it, it sets up properly. Um, now, we weren't going to make a race car. We weren't going to make something that was uncomfortable or something that was uh, too extreme because that's not what our customers want. But they wanted to be able to handle... Um, the way that they would that they would want to, to have a really enjoyable driving experience. Now, who's buying this? Because uh, I like to think that it's uh, moms who need to keep their kids quiet so they can floor it on the way to school. But it's probably it's probably <laughs> people who are uh, not so family oriented and a little bit more uh, single professionals. We've got yeah we have a we have a, a, a diverse group of buyers especially when you sell as many as explorers we do even ST so yes you definitely have your empty nesters but then you also have uh, families that are they're coming out of uh, maybe sports cars um, and they say well just because I have two kids now doesn't mean that I don't enjoy driving so you know drop the kids off at school or soccer practice or whatever but then when I've got my me time uh, behind the wheel. Um, I can actually go out and, and do some driving and have it be really enjoyable and sporty. Uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, one of the things that every Ford Explorer has in it, uh, or the option of, is the fact that this vehicle actually uh, reads traffic signs, but it allows you to cheat on your speed limit a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we our new adaptive cruise uh, system with speed side recognition, um, so you can set the cruise and it'll um, and it'll read the traffic in front, but it'll also adjust to the speed limits as you move, reading the speed limit signs. Now, um, you and I may not want to go exactly <laughs> the speed limit at all times. You, um, I feel like you know me well, Craig. I certainly don't. Want to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe we want to go a couple miles over. So, yeah, you can you can set it up to up to ten miles an hour over the speed limit as well. So, um, whatever you you feel is safe with traffic. That's fantastic. Uh, then you can so you can i know in england there isn't really a rule in the united states but in england the rule is 10 percent plus two so if it's 70 miles an hour mm -hmm. 79 miles an hour is what you can go before you get a ticket so but in right. america it's really up to the individual officer that decides but, right exactly you know. exactly but you know you you know what traffic is doing right if you're staying with the flow of traffic that's probably the safest way to drive so yeah I but don't, i don't know i've about, tried that ex craig i've tried the excuse <laughs> while on a highway in in nevada and i said i yeah. was trying to catch up with traffic and i was doing 94 miles an hour and, and he said why are you going so fast <laughs> i said i'm trying to keep up with traffic and he goes well, there is no traffic i said well i'm trying to catch it up you know that was it but it didn't <laughs> you it are didn't, the traffic it, it didn't work it wasn't effective <laughs> yeah I, I didn't get out of that one so well but uh so i'm not i, I totally get it the explorer 2 um one of the things that impressed me immensely on the launch of the vehicle uh was the fact that when you guys built this you had a, a model in your studio and it was bring the kids to work day and all these kids yeah. came in and you noticed that they absolutely annihilated the plaster version of the center console you had a plaster version for demonstration and the kids were all yes. stepping on it to get in and out of the third row so you made a decision yeah. to change the way that was constructed didn't you 
That's right. Yeah, our chief engineer actually had his daughters in, um, and that was where we got the idea. He said they were. He says they want to climb in. He says, well, why don't we just bring all the kids in and just have them? Um, let's see. It was kind of an idea of what we talk about as being human centered design, but it was really just very simply, let's just see how the kids react when they're in the vehicle. Um, and yeah, so our center console, um, it's always the trick when you've got a captain's chairs in the back row, do you put a console in there? So it's nice to have to, to, to store things, to have cup holders, but then if it is, you can't walk through. So we wanted to have something that you could step on and walk through, um, but also be able to, to utilize. So yeah, we, uh, we, we, uh, we had to upgrade the console because yeah, the, the, the model we had, that wasn't going to work. How fat can you be to uh, step on that without breaking it? Oh my gosh! Because I'm I, I'm a big boy. I'm a big boy. I like to you know. Yeah. I don't want to break it. Big. How much How much weight will it take? Craig? Well, I'm not I'm not actually certain, but I know that it will take my weight and Bill's weight, and okay. uh, and we're we're not too we're uh, we're up there as well. So, okay. Uh, so it's built for durability. Absolutely. I, I love that point. Uh, the also you kind of made the back very accessible too as well. If you have to put seats up and down. Yeah, so um, being able to get into the third row, or yeah, into the third row. So yeah, now you've got tip fold sliding seats to be able to easily jump into the third row. Um, we put a nice big uh, flat step pad because you never once you fold the seat forward, then where do you put your foot? Um, so now we've got a nice flat step pad to be able to to climb into the back row, uh, making it really easy. Um, Again, trying to keep it human centered. What are people? What are you? What are people using it? And how are? What are their pain points when they use it? I notice uh, my dad as he gets older. He's in like seventy seven, but he uh, we'll we'll bring these SUVs over and I'll take him out. We take him out to lunch once a week, and so he uh, climbing into the back of these vehicles. You, you know something? It's almost like having kids because he finds it harder and harder to get in and out the back of these vehicles and a little I'm not going to lift him up and put him in the back but the fact is that having these steps and these handles and these easily fold away seats really helps him when I put him in the back uh, because it's easier to get in and out of and that's kind of the a lot of people haven't done that in the past they always talk about oh yeah we got a tip folding seat or this thing but how someone gets in and out of the back is tough too right it absolutely is, and that's whether no matter what age, but um, certainly for kids, um, there is there is no patience for uh, for families that have to get out of the car and help their kids get into the car. Right? right. It's stop at the school pickup line, open the doors, they jump in, um, belt themselves in, and you're off. So um, if you have to get out of the car every time, that's not going to work. People are going to really dread that vehicle. Let's talk about uh, some of the cool stuff that's in the uh, ST as well. You got that 12-inch screen up front. Uh, a lot of car companies, uh, you know, they pride themselves in luxury car companies having uh, that uh, 12-inch screen. But uh, as luxury, but as as a family car company, you still added a 12-inch screen into the ST. Yeah, the 12-inch, the whole digital instrument cluster is a 12.3-inch digital cluster, so. Um, it's configurable. You can put up whatever information you want. So you can have the navigation in front of you. You can have the tachometer, um, speedometer, however you want. You can have the drive modes and see that on your on your instrument panel. Um, and then in the in the center stack, we have a uh, um, in in the middle of the vehicle, we have an eight inch screen. But then we also have an optional ten inch um, on both the ST and Platinum. That is. Um, uh, portrait oriented so sort of like your cell phone or a tablet um that's mounted on the on the dash so um people find it very very handy um having all that information right in front of them uh now this ex ex explorer st uh, how much does it cost and when does it go on sale so it's on sale now we're uh, we're, we're having really uh strong success with it out of the box we're selling about 35% of our sales right now are, are Explorer STs, so um, we've been on sale for a couple of months, so we're off to a really great start. Um, it starts at around 54, uh, 54.8 um, and then goes up from there with uh, some other performance and, uh, and luxury additions that you can, you can get, so it can go around to 60 or so. And if the ST isn't uh, in your wheelhouse, I mean, you have a regular Ford Explorer and you also have a hybrid, too. 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the we we have our our base, our XLT. We brought back. We brought in a hybrid, and the the nice thing with the hybrid, again, starting with a new architecture, is that no compromise with this hybrid. So, um, you can you have more horsepower, more torque, better fuel economy, and you have five thousand pounds towing. So you have all the things you want an SUV for, um, and and you may have experienced. We can even go off road with it. So um, for. So for folks that want an SUV but want a hybrid, um, it's a it's a great option. And let's talk about the off-road capability too, because you changed it from a front-wheel drive base to a rear-wheel b- drive base in the new Explorer, mm-hmm. and that actually yeah. that that vehicle uh, now it sort of makes it, I think, probably the longest vehicle in its category, doesn't it? Yeah, the the as far as a wheelbase, yes. The the actual dimensions of the vehicle, the um, the overall length didn't change. It was within an inch in every dimension. Um, but the uh, we took about six and a half inches on the wheelbase. So that what that does is shortens those overhangs on the front and the rear. Um, your approach angles and departure angles are short, so it's easy to get up um, and over things. So um, it 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 does make it even a more capable off road vehicle. That, like you say, with the rear-wheel drive architecture, being able to have a transfer case, being able to have um, drive modes, um, it really is a very capable off-road vehicle for people that like to do that. And something Ford have been doing for a while is uh, integrating Amazon Alexa into their vehicles as well, as well as Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, being able to, to have people to have their choice. So we've got our own sync system, um, but some people are more, uh, more familiar and like to use their what whatever they're using outside of their their car so they want to use alexa if they've got alexa at home they want to use alexa in their car if they've got apple products that they're used to having a screen in your car that just looks just like your screen on your tablet or on your phone um, is exactly the way people want to work all right well i i very much enjoyed the vehicle it's one of my favorite and uh, i would have no problem owning one if you had, and happen to have an extra ford explorer st yeah. I, i'll <laughs> i'll give it a home for you craig we'll check with the media fleet see if we can get one yeah <laughs> uh, excellent all right craig madison from ford thank you so much for joining us talking about the 2000 or uh, the brand new ford explorer st version if you want a thrilling drive in an suv it's definitely something that i would tell you to go test drive if your wheelhouse includes something like that catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website ourautoexpert.com you can hear the past shows automotive videos are there you can read inside car stories as well as your next ride. Find it all at OurAutoExpert.com. More show to come. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Welcome back to the show. Uh, one of the, I guess, best things that happens to us all year is the North, uh, Northwest Automotive Press Association runs with the sun. And the fact that we have all these cars that hit the Northwest uh, they get here, and then we have just tons and tons and tons of stuff to talk about forever. One of the vehicles that's been on everybody's lips since we drove it at the event was the brand new Kia Stinger GTS. Uh, this is a new trim level for them, and James Bell, and my friend James, joins us on the phone to talk a little bit about it. Uh, James, first of all, uh, where did you come up with this orange color? Because it's so bright. <laughs> did you have to get your paint guys to design a new color? Federation Orange, right? Nick, I got to be honest with you. We thought of you when we designed this. Car. <laughs> because, uh, I've seen I've seen some of the jackets you wear, my friend. And, uh, you know, we just try to we just try to keep up with you. It's a very bright orange. Does the GTS come in anything but the Federation orange? No, no, just Federation orange, and it's just a run of eight hundred of them. So uh, when you see one on the road, it will be uh, a rare occurrence, uh, and that's on purpose. I, and uh, it, it'll be rare and highly noticeable. I like it. Uh, the, you know, the Stinger has been one of these vehicles that uh, just is so outstanding. There's these German car companies who shall remain nameless, who spend a lot of time and a lot of money developing these sports cars, these sports sedans, which have long hoods and four doors. And uh, Kia managed to do it for considerably less than the Germans do it for, and yet come up with a great car. By those Germans, are you referring to Mercedes-Benz? Oh, Audi and you went there. <laughs> I, I have full confidence, my friend. The Kia Stinger delivers lots of swagger and 
confidence. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I'm sitting in one as we speak. Excellent. Uh, so so, so the, the Stinger actually itself has been quite a triumph for, uh, for Kia. When the sedan market has been declining, the, the Stinger yeah. sort of refreshed that market to make everybody see, you know, the sedan isn't this boring family car that's a toaster that you just use to get to and from work. It actually can be something dynamic and fun to drive. Especially when you look at the five-door variety, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, the, the rear space uh, in a five-door car is, is often you know, kind of shocking and will uh, really surprise, when you, especially when you put the rear seats down. It's very easy to get, um, you know, a full Costco run in this thing. Or uh, maybe if you take the front wheel off your bicycle, that will slide in. Right. Uh, so, yeah, the sedans, you know, it's funny. I, I think sedans take a, a bit of a hit for their cargo capacity which is not fair uh, because so many of modern sedans the trunk area is just really maximized for full space um and then but then when you take it to the next level and make it a five door so you have this this big hatch on the back um it, it makes driving a kind of cu- uh, lumbering uh not very exciting you know mid to small size suv pretty silly especially if you're somebody who who actually looks forward to driving like you and I. Right. I mean, this is an interesting thing about Americans, because I'm, and I don't personally get it, and, and auto journalists don't get it in general. But Americans don't like the word hatch, and they don't like the word wagon. Because as soon as you mention hatch or wagon, it's like... Oh, oh, oh. Do you want me to explain to you what the problem yeah. is? <laughs> yes, what's the problem, Megan? Okay, uh, for those of us that grew up in the 80s, we were all thrown in the back of a wagon, a station wagon. All right. And we all barely lived. But there are a lot of sexy wagons out there now. Well, that's completely different. All right. So so no hatches and no wagons, yet uh, when you call it a sports sedan, everybody loves it. And you put a, you put a hatch well, door on the back. I, and it's a hatch door, right? I mean, it's a hatch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm going to just jump in a little bit on that conversation. I, I agree with what you said about um, being raised in them. So there's, there's that element. But what uh, we're not playing into is the fact that there's a whole new generation who are looking at uh, vehicles that are common and popular and saying, why in the world would you want to drive something that's, you know, again, not fun to drive, uh, higher, more kind of lumbering around when I could have something that carries just as much stuff and do it in a, in a uh, smaller, more um, kind of streamlined and, and in many cases, much sexier package. And we're seeing that amongst younger buyers really been pushed harder, um, hard and thankfully to uh, by companies like Subaru, mm-hmm. who stuck with that and are very popular amongst younger buyers. Um, you know, and, and some of the um, Audi wagons, A4 wagons, which are very popular with younger buyers. So it's, it isn't, um, yes, there is a stigma, but I think that's only to old, po- old folks like you and I. The younger <laughs> generation come along. And I'm doing. The younger I'm, generation come along is it does not feel that same way. I'm, I'm not doing that old man. I'm doing everything I can not to be old. Like I'm fighting <laughs> the gray hair fight, and so anything like a stinger makes me feel just a little bit more sexy. Well, you are why do you sexy, think I'm Nick. In one right now? <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think you have any trouble, my friend. I think you're uh, you're uh, okay you're with that kind. one. Uh, tell me a little bit about the GTS in the couple of minutes we have left. Uh, this is a trim level, is sort of the, that's a new trim level for you. Yeah. So basically, uh, kind of ca- capturing the success of the of the GT and just kind of amplifying it in some ways uh, with uh, you know Alcantara steering wheel. Alcantara surfacing on some of the um, where your elbows rest on the on the uh, arm pads and so forth. Um, fantastic carbon fiber, real carbon fiber bits and pieces uh, around the grill surround on the rear um, valance panel. What I love, and you're going to see, I'll give you a little sneak peek here. You're going to be seeing this more and more often on Stingers is the full Stinger name across the back as opposed to the Kia badge. That is sexy. Um, so it, yeah, it just looks better. It it should have been. Between you and me, it should... Well, I'm on the radio. This is probably... (laughs) It's too late. It's already implied. We all know what you're going to (laughs) say. Yeah, I I like that big badge, and uh, I just think... Nothing against the Kia badge, of course. I just think the Stinger name is cool, and it should be amplified and celebrated. I agree. We're starting that process with the GTS. Uh, uh, Good for you. Thumbs up. Big thumbs up for you. Uh, Price and availability. Are there any of the 800 left, or are we going to have to buy a regular Stinger? They are going very quickly. Uh, I haven't seen the hard numbers on them. They've been on sale now for, I guess, about a month. Uh, I'm not sure where the numbers are. They may be already gone. I, I don't know. But they come in two trim levels, either the um, rear-wheel drive set up uh, in the same Federation orange paint with the carbon fiber bits and pieces and, and some of the niceties we talked about. Uh, but then there's also the um, all-wheel drive version, which, of course, brings in drift 
uh, ability, which, of course, as you know, whoop, an all-wheel drive car <clears throat> will not drift. But um, Albert Bierman, our fantastic engineer uh, there in, in Korea, has come up with a way to make an all-wheel drive very driftable. It sends Once you engage that mode, it sends all the power to the rear wheels, holds the car in gear, nice. and allows you to get uh, a nice. little bit sideways on purpose. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, and very he's not good. kidding. I watched, I watched this guy drift that car like an insane person. Yeah, no, a couple it's, years ago. It, it's it was incredible. Amazing. Don't ever let Albert go anywhere, by the way. Just keep hold oh, of him. Oh, no. <laughs> keep hold I, of him. I, I, have a, I have a GPS thing attached to him. He's with us. Very good. <laughs> Clever idea. James Bell from Kia. Kia.com is where you can find out about the new GTS, the Stinger in that Federation Orange. Uh, I wouldn't be sad if I had one in my driveway for the rest of my life. Coming up, we're going to be talking to Brian Armistead about Trail Trek Tour. This is a guy who maybe does better in a towel robe, but got off road that's coming up on our auto expert you're listening to our auto expert now he's uh he is probably one of the best automotive uh reporters in the country and i get to spend quite a lot of time talking to him he's a really nice guy too and uh, we always make fun of his uh, his height too that's probably because i'm super short and and brian armstead's uh, super tall but brian when i think of you i think of somebody that enjoys towel robes and uh pedicures but yet you have just been <laughs> on an off-road adventure <laughs> you got me pegged all wrong <laughs> really but I, do, I, I do you do have half of any place right i do love a great off-road adventure and i gotta tell you nick and jen uh, Phil Vandervossen and his wife, Carlo Vandervossen, have created the Trail Trek Tour. Now, Phil is a, he's a, he's an entrepreneur. He has a website called Knoxon.com, which Knoxon is basically man stuff. You've got, you know, cars, you've got gear, you've got fashion, you've got all the things that men like to do when, when we're doing out there. You know, it's all that good man stuff. So, so you know, Phil started getting invited, started getting invited on automotive press events, and he came up with this idea: why not get automotive media together, and we'll have a challenge to see who can excel off road and just kind of break down these vehicles and give them a, a good bit of scrubbing off road. Now, two weeks ago, I had the pleasure to go to Danville, Pennsylvania, and I call it almost home, almost heaven, Pennsylvania, because it's just a beautiful, beautiful state, lots of trees. The mighty Susquehanna River, just an amazing venue to hold the fourth stop on the Trail Trek Tour. Now, this stop, uh, Nick and Jen, was the Midsize Truck Off-Road Challenge. It featured the Chevy Bison ZR2, the Colorado ZR2 Bison, the Jeep Gladiator Rubicon, the Toyota Tacoma TRD Pro, and the Ford Ranger FX4. So we got together the night before. We had dinner at the uh, famous... Pine Barn Inn, and the uh, Van Boston created some history for us to tell us about the history of the that famous spot. You know, I don't have enough time to go into the history, but say the Van Boston covered all the bases to make sure we not only had a great off-road tour, but we also learned something in the process. We even had little artifacts from like the river. They had ducks from the river uh, decoys to indicate the Susquehanna River on our dinner table. So we had a river flowing down the middle of our dinner table. Nice. Oh, that's like that. cool. Just, just really cool. Uh, the foggy day, was it was on. And, you know, Nick, one of the advantages of, of being in this business is we get to go do some cool things. Nick and Jen, you know, the, the racetrack stuff is great, but it's pretty dangerous. Uh, this trail, off-road stuff can be very, too. I'm, I've been on some Land Rover trips where you're looking down at a 1,500-foot drop, and you're like, well, I'm out here. <laughs> but you get to it because the vehicles are so capable. So we were at the Anthracite Outdoor Adventure Area in Cold Township, Pennsylvania. It's a massive 6,500-acre former coal mine. Now, I've never seen a bit of coal in my life, but it's old coal strewn everywhere. And a lot of closed mines, a lot of artifacts from the coal era. It's a really cool place. Well, these entrepreneurs, Dave Corsi and his gang, have gotten together and they've turned it into an off-road area. There's going to be development around this off-road area. Hotels are coming. Restaurants are coming. So it'll be a cool place for a man and a woman or a family to go get off-road and be next to nature and learn how to handle the capabilities of these very capable uh, sport utilities that we have on the market today and sport pickup trucks that we have on the market today. 
They're really. It's all over the bike. I'm sorry, go ahead. That sounds like an amazing activity for families with teens. It's, it's a great activity for families with children, Jen, because you learn about nature. I mean, there are so many species indigenous to that area, certain ducks and, and, you know, and though, wild, I don't... wild life and. I don't think the teens will care about the nature. It's definitely the off-roading. <laughs> definitely <laughs> the off-roading. Well, I mean, he, he couldn't have picked, uh, or the manufacturers who participated couldn't have provided four better vehicles. Uh, the Chevy Colorado DRT Bison was very unique in that it was outfitted with a snorkel. And uh, Nick and Jed, you know what a snorkel is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So for water oh, or for right. dust? Yeah. Which, which one for? No, it's, it's, it's for water. So it's okay. for you know, depth of like almost three feet without drowning the engine and causing hydrolock, where the engine literally drowns itself, uh, crossing rivers or streams that might be a little bit higher than you thought they were. So this bison had the snorkel. Um, it's an A and B available snorkel. had front and rear locking differentials, which is great when you're climbing rocks or you know, loose gravel, and uh, all kinds of rock sliders and plates underneath to keep it from bottoming out and damaging the other carriage off-road. That was kind of the being for all four of them. Uh, and I think that the only one that's really perfect built to totally excel off-road is the Jeep Betty and Rubicon. It was the favorite of everybody, of the eight of us that were there. It was the clear favorite. But I mean, Jeep has been in this off-road game for a long time. They're not taking a pickup truck and turning it into an off-road vehicle like the Tacoma or the Colorado they're taking a off-road vehicle and turning it into the into a pickup truck. In the, in the case of the Rubicon Gladiator, because if you remember Nick from back in the day, they used to have the Comanche, which was a Jeep with a pickup bed. So they've reprised the thing years later. It's got a five-foot box on the rear, and it's all Jeep you know, rock track four by four, locking front and rear axles, skid plates, heavy metal skid plates, thirty-three inch off-road tires. Electronic sway bar disconnect. Now, Jen, this is very important as you're climbing boulders and climbing rocks. You can electronically disconnect the sway bar, which allows for more wheel articulation. They height up and down articulation of the wheel as you do a slow crawl over nature's obstacles on these off road courses. The uh, Rubicon was the only, the G Platy and the Rubicon was the only one with the articulate, with the electronic uh, disconnecting sway bar. It was clearly the king of the off-road trail, but the Ford Ranger, the Toyota Tacoma TRD Pro, and the Colorado ZR2 Bison were certainly more than capable. We went through mud. We went through water. We went through some pretty deep water. There's one shot of me up on Instagram where I'm going through water that's clearly up to the belt line of the Ford Ranger because if you listen to an instructor, and we had an instructor from the Anthracite off-road course, he was on a two-way the whole time. He told us what to do. He said, Brian, you're a little bit too far to the right. And I looked down at Dan Carney, my drive partner, another noted automotive writer. He said, maybe you are. So, you know, luckily the Ford didn't hydrolock, but we had uh, water right up to the window, Nick and Jen. Uh, mud, loose rocks, cold, tree stumps, trees down, everything that you could handle was thrown at us at the AAOW course. Uh, it's in Danville again, Pennsylvania, and it's just a sensational uh, off-road adventure. Uh, the next one's coming up at a place in Virginia. I failed to write down the name, but he's got a series of these off-road adventures coming up. I would highly advise you or Jen to get on one, and we can, you know, I'd be happy to come back on and compare notes. Yeah. About this whole uh, this whole trail trek tour type of scenario. You can go to trailtrektour.com and uh, see what the uh, next adventure is by the band of bosses. And you can also look at their uh, their uh, Instagram page, Trail Trek Tour. And Phil and, Phil and Carla, congratulations. This was a sensational use of my time. Um, the, two, the vehicles were terrific. Which one was Thanks to favorite? Jeep and Ford and Chevy and Toyota for participating. It was just a fabulous experience over a course of three days. It's really, really well done. I think we might uh, we might be able to find some sort of time for family to be able to do that as well. The one thing I was going to say to you, Brian, was uh, when I was in Australia last, uh, they, all of their snorkels on their vehicles are actually there for uh, for dust. 
instead of water. Okay. So uh, we'll go check it out. Brian, uh, where can we read the majority of your stuff? Well, I have uh, drivelatino.com, uh, the Detroit Bureau.com, and also you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Road Gear Sun, like the big old sun in the sky. Excellent. Brian Armistead, we always enjoy having you on the show. He's got great stories. And, of course, I live vicariously through you. Hunting <clears throat> off-roading for me, as, as long as there's a shower and cable TV, I'm happy. Uh, just, just, just the whole nail thing. Man. You know that's not my speed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm sometimes weak, a weakling when it comes to that. Coming up, Anton Woolman, as our auto expert continues, we'll talk about what's going on in the electric car world. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Welcome back to the show. Of course, you can check up with us on social media, Our Auto Expert on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and start a conversation with us. We're pretty nice people. Uh, at least I am. Most anyway, of the time. Uh, other people, I don't know. Pretty nice people. Really? Uh, Anton Wallman <laughs> is, uh, joins us every single week. Uh, we like to talk to Anton about what the latest things are going on in the car world. One of the problems with, uh, you know, with big car shows is you get a lot of car companies rolling out really cool stuff, and uh, you don't actually get to see it for many, many years, which always bugs me. So, of course, all the stuff from the Frankfurt Auto Show was always really tough to talk about. Um, Anton, uh, this I saw a report this morning that talked about uh, what that the fact that Tesla seemed to have, be having a surge in China as far as registering vehicles were concerned. Uh, are they selling more vehicles now? Well, Tesla is having a bit of a surge, as it were, uh, uh, although it's not actually from China. I think that report was uh, incorrect. Basically, the company is seeing a surge in a few countries, such as the Netherlands, uh, and in the first right-hand drive markets to which it is delivering this quarter, namely the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. And uh, really, it's driven in to such a large extent just by the Netherlands alone. The Netherlands is having a particular tax subsidy that expires at the end of this year. So the Dutch are basically rushing out to buy a Tesla now before the Dutch tax subsidy expires at the end of the year. So what is going to happen on January 1st in the Netherlands is that Tesla sales is likely going to collapse almost 100% as it has done in other places where their tax subsidies have just expired. But of course, leading up to this event, they're going to have some extremely strong sales uh, between now and the end of the year. And in the month of September alone, I'm watching very carefully the Dutch uh, uh, car registrations, which are reported with a lag of somewhere between one and two days. And they're going to end up selling over 5,500 cars, no matter what, just in the month of September in the Netherlands, which is, uh, which is an extremely strong showing for Tesla in such a small country. They still losing a lot of money per car. Uh, you know, one of the things they were doing in the United States is losing about $5,500 a car. Are they doing the same in the Netherlands? Yeah, it's hard to parcel out the economics uh, based on geography for them, but uh, they are overall, of course, selling a greater degree of their cars being the being the um, lesser equipped ones with a lower range, only rear wheel drive. And of course, almost all of their sales now is the Model 3. So the cheaper cars tend to have the lower margin. So barring any accounting gimmicks, I would expect that the company is still going to have a fairly poor margin situation uh, even uh, even in this quarter, and it will still post a loss. But you know how it goes. Sometimes you have these very complicated and arcane accounting rules that allow you to, uh, you know, basically loosen up some of the reserves that you took in previous quarters. And, you know, for example, if they uh, enable a couple of features of autopilot, then they can say, well, some of the deferred revenue that they uh, booked in previous quarters, they can all jam them down in this quarter, thereby generating a, you know, a one-time gain of two or $300 million. So you could see that um, on paper, they will show us slightly better results than the actual operations of 
of making and selling cars. That is entirely within the range of possible, but we won't know that until they report their full and full financial results at the end of October. You know, t- uh, we've we've seen Tesla tittering or tottering on the edge of the the sort of precipice for for many years. They have to refinance constantly. Uh, they have a huge amount of debt, uh, some billions of dollars worth of debt. Uh, they don't look like a good investment. There's been legal troubles with the DOJ and uh, with the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, they seem to escape every single time that the anvil falls down. Is is it going to continue forever? Uh, well, you know, the cat has nine lives, and I don't know if we are now on life number five or life number eight or nine. I mean, that's the big parlor game here, isn't it? Uh, so the company has a lot of legal challenges, such as their uh, merger with Solar City and how they made that happen and what they were saying or not saying, and down the list it goes. So, But I think that those are hard to calculate in terms of when a legal issue is finally going to lay down the hammer, I think we are really going to have to focus on the competitive environment and its impact on margins. I think the most basic fundamental question that a would-be investor in Tesla would ask is basically the margin impact on all of these new cars that come in and are very competitive. Stand by, Anton. When we come back, we'll talk about VW and more on Our Auto Expert. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Anton Warman is our guest on the phone. We're talking about uh, the latest in business as far as automotive companies are concerned. VW has uh, labeled its electric cars, the ID3 and the ID4, uh, and not very inventive. Will that be the final versions of these cars when they hit the market? Well, uh, speaking of uh, naming cars in a very sort of uh, Germanistic way with a number and letter combination, starting with a one and ending with a nine, and you know there being two or three letters. Uh, this is also the week when um, Johann de Nijen joined Volkswagen in North America as the new uh, number two, and of course he was previously with Audi. And in between those two, he went to uh, Infiniti and he went to Cadillac and imposed similar naming schemes. So things have kind of gotten around here. Uh, to uh, this sort of naming scheme in which uh, Volkswagen is now going to uh, jump wholeheartedly into the electric era. So, uh, yeah, it's not particularly inventive, in my opinion, not very interesting, and I, I don't think it's a, it's a great choice to pick those names. I think they should have done something far more interesting. Now, of course, Volkswagen doesn't necessarily have a lot of good legacy names to choose from, but... Uh, uh, one would have thought that maybe they could have come up with something better. I think that uh, Denotion actually ended up, you know, I, I making Infinity change all their names when he was there, and then Cadillac change all their names when he was there. And VW used to have, uh, they used to name all their vehicles after wins until the Tiguan came along, which was a mixture between Tiger and Iguana. But they always used to, you know, the Passat was a, was named after a weather system. The Golf was named after a weather system. The uh, the Jetta was named after a weather system. So uh, you see people going to single names and n- nomenclature for their vehicles, Tesla Model 3, etc. But then you see companies... Uh, like Ford and Lincoln going back to the names of vehicles. Lincoln are definitely, you know, the MKZ, the MKX, the MKC now being replaced by the Corsair and by the Aviator. Certainly, I will say that I think Lincoln has done exactly the right thing here, picking really, really good names that I think will stand the test of time. Hopefully their cars will actually meet up to these great naming standards that they have finally come out with over the last couple of years here. So uh, I'd certainly give them a 10.0 for coming up with good names. Cadillac, of course, had in his drawer left over from previous generations some of the very best things imaginable. For example, if you're going to launch an electric car in your General Motors, I mean, how on God's green earth would you not label it the El Dorado? The electric Dorado, for crying out loud. And what about Fleetwood? I mean... Come on, they had the best names around and they squander them. And the Hummer, I mean, you've seen what Bollinger has done now with coming out with a, an electric off-road Jeep that is extremely retro. Probably the only electric car that I've seen to come to market that 
uh, doesn't have digital gauges or right. has some sort of connectivity features. It's like an, it's like going electric in an analog world while looking retro. This is what Hummer ought to have been, for crying out loud. If GM had been smart, they would have jumped into the electric era with this type of retro off-road vehicle. That would have. I mean, wouldn't this have been the greatest hit of all time if they had done that? I mean, I, somehow the, there's something in, in product planning and management here that uh, uh, it's just left to be desired. I don't know. I think I think the GM have definitely been looking at the Hummer brand and wondering, you know, where they're at with it. Who knows if they have something secretly under the works? They they have a lot of product that they need to bring out and, and refresh over the next few years. And definitely with a lot of the vehicles, the sedans disappearing, the opportunity is going to be great for them to do something. Whether they will take that opportunity remains to be seen. Although I will say, too, that a lot of these car companies, I mean, Lincoln is a, is a perfect example. I think the new Lincoln uh, sedan, which will come out next year sometime, which will be placing the MKZ, replacing that, I think that will probably be called the Zephyr. That's my guess. Yeah, that I have no idea what it will be called, but is there really any market left for the dance at this point? I mean, the uh, Continental that they came out with three or four years ago was a decent, that was actually quite a good-looking product, but, uh, I mean, look at the sales numbers, and they're horrific. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, people are looking for in a sedan is not a luxury. They're looking for performance or they're looking for uh, utility. And uh, luxury sedans may, may be tougher. Although, you know, BMW is still doing things, the, you know, showing concepts in Frankfurt of the new four. Uh, so th- there obviously is some game in it because people are still producing them. And even you talk to Toyota and you'll talk to Honda, they still tell us that they will they sell uh, a huge amount of of their uh, family sedans still even though america has gone suv crazy family sedans are still purchased um and they're still enough purchased enough to make it worthwhile producing them i guess that's right i mean the market is still of a respectable size even though it seems to be in perpetual decline i mean it's declining from a very large level but in order to play in that field and be able to play so profitably you you have to really um, be honest with yourself as an automaker what am i really bringing to the party here that is going to enable me to extract some decent profitability in a segment where people tend to be very very price conscious when it comes to buying a sedan because if you're buying a sedan as opposed to some sort of crossover suv a buyer i surmise thinks to him or herself that, wow, at least I'm going to get a car at a lower price. So the, I think the opportunity for margins in sedans for all but the most exclusive brands has got to be very, very tight. Now, let's talk a little bit about Denoyshin going back to VW. Uh, when he left Cadillac, it, it seemed to be under quite a cloud. Well, I mean, it was clear that he was uh, let go, that for whatever reason... He didn't make things happen. Maybe it was a personality clash with the rest of management or there was some other metric performance-wise where they really felt upset. I mean, any combination of that is within the range of possible. But, uh, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a surprise to see him come back as uh, now the number two guy uh, for Volkswagen North America. I mean, if memory serves me right, and then Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't, the current head of Volkswagen North America, Scott Keel, didn't he used to work for yep. He's, uh, had out in North America, so didn't they just switch seniority in this uh, switcheroo here? Well, a little bit more than that. So Denation uh, Yu was the master originally, and Kehoe was the student. Uh, and now Kehoe That's went right. from went from Audi to being the head of Volkswagen Group itself, which of course includes Lamborghini and Bugatti and all of the other VW brands in the United States. So uh, although Kehoe is is the student, he is now the boss of everything in North. North America, and now Denoyshin is back under him. So maybe do you think? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe I think it's a payback somewhat. Uh, maybe it's a, uh, hey boss, you were the one that elevated me and gave me an opportunity and brought me here. Perhaps, uh, perhaps he's saying uh, I honor you or I give you privilege. But I'm sure he had to get it past the bo- the board in Germany. No, clearly. I mean, I mean, I, I, I honestly do not know here at all what happened. A- almost anything is possible. But I just find that situation somewhere between curious and poetic that it that they they made this switch which is certainly not something i would have anticipated this was a as of a total surprise as anyone i could have imagined 
One of the biggest things I think that sticks out in my head is through some of the darkest years at Cadillac and through some of the darkest years at Infinity, uh, Johann uh, de Neuschen was the head of those organizations. He didn't redeem himself after leaving Audi. Um, he had a lot of ideas. He brought a lot of ideas into Cadillac and into Infinity about how to uh, you know, push the brand forward, especially with Cadillac. He redesigned the whole architecture of the company and uh, moved the company to New York, um, and that seems to have been a massive failure for them. Uh, it just wasn't in the DNA, whereas a company like Lincoln, which is the other luxury car company for America, American-born luxury car company. Uh, Lincoln has maintained its roots in Detroit. It's maintained its heritage, and they're now shining and growing and blossoming and having some amazing new vehicles, whereas Cadillac have every opportunity to grow but don't seem to have seized the day. Yeah, and I think the result at Infinity may even have been worse because at Infinity, the naming scheme was so amazingly confusing from top to bottom that when you look at people searching for new vehicle purchases, anybody who measures those, those metrics learned very quickly that um, basically the buyers just disappeared. They just didn't know where to look anymore. At least with Cadillac, he didn't touch that one name that was the company's crown jewel, and that was the Escalade. So because of the fact that they didn't touch the crown jewel in, in the in the brand portfolio, the Escalade, at least that one continued to do very well throughout and essentially kept the whole thing together, even though some of the other models, most namely the, the sedans, the sedans, continued to underperform. So that's kind of how it worked out. So uh it was a uh, you know very much a mixed bag there. And Audi has has had some troubles recently. I mean their sales have plummeted. They've had a really hard time with sales. I saw the number one selling vehicle uh, this summer for them was the Audi A6, which is unusual since they have a great lineup of uh, Q vehicles, which are their SUVs. Uh, they, they have met some trouble. And VW doesn't seem to have escaped entirely from the Dieselgate scandal, too. Now there's still uh, more legal action happening in Germany. Yeah, so in Germany, of course, the German authorities have gone after the leadership because of a particular quirk here, and that is that the management at Volkswagen basically found out in late July of 2015 that they had an issue with respect to Dieselgate, but they didn't come clean on it until something like September 18. So almost two months went by without them telling the market about this. And the argument by the German authorities goes that that is essentially a form of securities fraud. That is the argument that they are uh, making. And caught up in this whole thing was actually the current CEO of the whole group, Herbert Dies. You may recall that Herbert Dies had just joined Volkswagen. It was just a couple of months before, not even, the, you know, literally a couple of months before this whole thing happened. But he was sitting in the room, maybe uh, just fresh in the seat to the tune of nine weeks or whatever, in the seat at that late July meeting, and he did not say anything to the public. So they're going after him, even though he had just joined Volkswagen shortly before, because the argument goes that, hey, just because he hadn't been there a long time, that doesn't mean that he wouldn't have had to uh, say something out loud if, uh, if he was presented by this, even on the first day of his job. So uh, that's the situation there right now, and, it's, uh, and that's a pretty tough one for Volkswagen to defend. Uh, you know, Vo Volkswagen, of course, uh, dropped their diesel ideas and moved forward with electricity from uh, probably around mid-2016, 17 onwards, because they sort of knew this was coming. Do you think they'll be able to redeem themselves out of Dieselgate? Because they seem to be leading the field with things like Electrify America and with electrifying their, some, of, some of these new vehicles. You know, the basic platform for the future of electrification is coming from, from VW. Well, I think they've got a couple of things going for them. I mean, they've picked actually an architectural design for their EVs uh, that is that makes a lot of sense, especially in the low end, going with a rear-wheel drive-based architecture, basically saying, look, we're not going to be some sort of vanilla electric car company where we're going to be building this thing, stamping them out, and just like we're doing with a Chevy Spark or a Chevy Sonic, that generated the uh, Chevy Bolt, but rather we're going to go with something where since we're starting here instead with a clean sheet on white paper, 
we're going to uh, start out with our rear wheel drive based platform that is going to be superior in terms of vehicle dynamics and overall packaging. So I think that they, uh, they've picked a lot of um, good ideas here, but the ultimate space is really a rest out of their hands yeah. because it's all dependent on subsidies. Right. The subsidies aren't there. The problem uh, is going to become a severe economic one for VW. Alton, where can we read your stuff? You can reach it at seekingalpha.com as well as on thestreet.com. You're listening to Our Auto Expert podcast at ourautoexpert.com. You've been listening to Our Auto Expert with Nick Mile. Find all the show episodes at ourautoexpert.com. Please follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Our Auto Expert. And message us for a quick and witty response. Yeah.